Hey, Gestalt Education Nation, uh, new sponsor alert, new sponsor alert. Today, we're excited to announce uh, Dynamic Disc Designs and Jerome Fryer. Uh, we have an awesome discount code for you. Just use the code Gestalt uh, to get a little bit of money off on the, the Dynamic Disc Designs. They're the, the most realistic anatomical discs that we've ever seen. If you caught our, our episode with uh, Dr. Stuart McGill, you saw an entire shelf full of them. Everything from cavitation instruction to uh, di- uh, disc dysfunction to SI joint dysfunction, all sorts of amazing joint stuff. Joint movement, yes. vertebral movement. Absolutely. So uh, go to Dynamic Disc Designs, uh, use the code Gestalt. As always, you can use the code Gestalt on Core360 belt to get a, a little discount on the belts there. We love to use that for biofeedback, for teaching respiration, intra-abdominal pressure, and how the, the abdominal wall should be working in, during function. Uh, and then the last one, use the code Gestalt Education 10 Those will all be in the description in the podcast. Gestalt Education 10 at humanlocomotion.com uh, to get off uh, some money off of all of his awesome gadgets and tools and uh, rehab uh, materials. What's your favorite, Brett? He's got a trunk full, but I think, you know, integrating the Topro in, I think, has been a game changer for us here at the office. So I think that would be my pick. Beautiful. All right, guys, don't forget, use the code Gestalt, Gestalt Education 10. Uh, visit the show notes and you'll be uh, hooked up. Thanks. Enjoy the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Today, we are gonna we're gonna break down a topic that has kind of been a topic of conversation in basically all of our doctors' meetings here at Winchester Spine and Sport Brett. And it's something that is uh, it's difficult for was difficult for me in my first couple of years, I know. And it's something that you've been preaching a lot, and uh, that's the concept of fixing people with these chronic injuries or chronic conditions. Um, it. Sometimes you get in the chronic pain classification, as we've talked about, because you get in bad treatment. And sometimes you just have bad anatomy or, or a bad internal environment and things like that. And so um, can you kind of break it down for us, Brett, to start off with of just like, you know, what are some of these conditions that it's sometimes it's not about fixing them. It's about managing the condition. And, you know, sometimes we're not going to get to 100 percent with a lot of these patients. Right. Right. Well, I think, too, I mean, where I got to this point, it was a very humbling moment in my career when, you know, me being in it, especially at that time, a relatively small town and, you know, being around the same people all the time, whether that's at Walmart, seeing them at Walgreens or like just at the ball field, whatever it might be. And you run into your previous patients And I think early on, you know, I really, in my mind, I thought that I was going to fix everyone in three visits. And I'm not going to say that can't occur because we all know what those cases look like. (laughs) But what I started to notice was I'd run into some of my old patients and, you know, they would tell me that maybe they had a surgery. Maybe the ones that really stick out to me were decompression cases where, oh, I did spinal decompression and, you know, I I got better or whatever it might be. They, They did something else besides what I had told them to do or what happens a lot of times is you just don't see your patients. And because you don't see them, you don't know what the trajectory of that case actually look like. So in your mind, you're actually thinking these people are doing great, but in reality, they end up doing something else. Right. <clears throat> so I really kind of had like this watershed moment in my career where I realized like I have got to do a way better job of actually changing function in that case. And I think that you know, sometimes people misconstrue that to where like, we we're not being empathetic and we don't care about the pain. Um, I think we talk about that here all the time. Like we, you have to listen to your patients well, but one message I think that will resonate really well is the one of, you know, I'm here to change the function of your body. You know, there's so many different things that are going to affect, you know, how you're going to report your pain. You know, we, we know that through Annie O'Connor and other, these, you know, pain experts. So, I mean, we definitely need to treat those patients a little bit differently. But the one thing that we can do is we can do, you know, a really good job of changing the actual function of that case. And I mean, you can make it as difficult as you want, which people in our world do. Or at the at the end of the day, we need to get joints moving that are stiff. We need to move them in the planes of motion that are not moving well. We need to maybe change like densification or trigger points or tone in the soft tissues. We need to teach a central nervous system how to better recruit the muscles around whatever joint we're trying to uh, have an effect on, you know, let's start there. You know, (laughs) what's what's wrong with that? I think like people try to make it so complicated when if they would just do a really good job of those three things and like, keep it simple. I think like they're well on their, their path to changing the function of that case. And I think when you really do that, well, the patients, they, they leave you alone too. Mm -hmm. Like they're not like, 
oh, I still have a little bit of pain here. I still, because <laughs> everything comes down to that. I mean, I, I think too, it all starts with, you know, how, when you enter the treatment room, like you having function as a priority. And what I mean by that is when you walk in, instead of asking them how they're doing, you know, with their, their, uh, symptoms that day, instead go right into the biomechanics of what you found. That could be a, a joint play. That could be a soft tissue. That could be a functional test. That could be a squat that can, whatever, whatever it is you're wanting to come back to not only for yourself, but to let them know that what you're doing is there to change function. That would be number one. The second thing is to find the, you know, the, at the everyday activity that they're, they're being affected with. Maybe they, you know, originally they talked about not being able to sleep. Maybe it's a spinal stenosis case where they said, I can only walk to the mailbox. So then we're looking for functional capacity. Well, can you now walk to the mailbox and then back to the house without having your symptoms? Because I think what's hard is we live in such a binary world where we think these cases should be a hundred percent better. Like I think like a lot of times your patients are putting unnecessary pressure on us because like they're 50% better like in a week, you know, and I mean, that's great. You know, mm -hmm. so like we just need to keep doing more of the same things of what we're doing. And I think that, you know, when you're a functionalist and you're truly changing function, uh, the one lesson to be, to be learned is, I mean, you can't do that in a visit or two. You can, you can drastically change pain in a visit or two. And, you know, in the, the seminar setting, I always give the analogy of, you know, if you've completely change pain 100% and then you have not changed function at all, which this happens a lot with our, with the new patients, you know, especially in the acute new patients. <laughs> so that patient is what the trajectory of that is. A lot of times they are going to relapse because they've felt better for a couple of days, but the function, the actual problem has not been truly addressed yet. So and I think like most evidence-based clinicians like ourselves and people listening, we, you know, we're, we're, we're so concerned about doing the right thing that sometimes we under treat the patient. And, uh, and because of that, we actually don't ironically end up changing function or like the people that claim to be treating function. Once the patient says, Oh, I'm out of pain, then they cut them loose. So, right. uh, you know, I think it's just, uh, it, it's hard because you got to, as a clinician, you got to be bought into it yourself. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that takes a while for you to get the, the confidence and the bravado to be able to have that confidence to keep that patient on board. Uh, the other thing we always talk about here is, you know, you have your chiropractic mir miracle on the continuum, and then you have your patient that's going to surgery. Well, thankfully, 0.0001% we send for surgery. I mean, you know, it's a couple times a year. So what about all those patients in between? And we call that the black hole. So those patients in the black hole need to be educated on a functional model. We need to continue to be changing the function of the uh, kinematic sequence of their body or kinetic chain, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, when we do that, give yourself enough time to be successful. Yeah, that's right. And I think, uh, you, those three things you talked about changing joint function, soft tissues, and then, uh, maybe a functional test or anything along those lines that allows you to not get caught in the weeds on these difficult chronic cases. You know, yes. how many times do you walk in a new patient? They've got 15 things checked on the review of systems. They've got, they're on 14 medications. They've had back pain for 12 years. Like it, it's overwhelming. Like, where do you start? You know, how do you not get caught in that 50 minute of just interviewing them on their subjective symptoms or like their past history and stuff like that? And I think you, you just got to start somewhere, you know, like you, you go back to the things that, you know, the joint play, the palpate, uh, the soft tissues, uh, the walking, whatever it might be. And if you just start there and then slowly start to unravel those more complicated hitting factors, then the next thing you know, like you're starting to make progress. But if you don't give yourself a chance to unravel those and you're just like, well, we'll, we'll try this today and see how you feel tomorrow. You know, like those, those, then you get caught in the weeds and then you're lost. And so is the patient and the confidence isn't there down the stretch. Yeah. And I, the patient has to know why they're there. So one of the most important things on the front end of that treatment visit of doing what we said is you're, you're reporting back to them how the function of their cases, you can think of it this way. There's two things. There's the subjective pain experience, and then there's the functional profile of, of that case. And I always finish every visit with saying, 
I, I know what your pain is. Your function is this percent better. This is what we're still continuing to work on. And if you do a great job on that, then they know why they're here. If you can't do that, the second they're out of pain, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And then honestly, you're just basically, basically an aspirin at that point, you know, like, so I think all of us who, who, you know, would be listening to this and ourselves, I mean, we truly are wanting to make like long lasting changes in our patients and to do a good job of that, especially like in a, in a chronic case, it's going to take you a second. So, uh, you need to have the confrontation skill with the patient to be able to let them know what it is. And I think too, um, if you are trying to sell a bunch of visits on the front end, most patients immediately kind of get their guard up. Mm -hmm. So I think like, although you might have to see them for some visits, like just do it the right way. Like, I mean, you don't want to feel like you're selling a timeshare or you're buying steak knives or something like, I mean, you just got to find your, the right way to do it. I think, um, you know, the way we do it here that seemed to work pretty well is we kind of do it in three week chunks. You know, like if we saw a new patient, we'll see it twice a week for three weeks. At three weeks, I will reevaluate you and we'll see what we're doing. I'm not guaranteeing they're going to be better. There's so many variables in, in patients' lives, I mean, that you can't control. So, I mean, like, don't, don't get stuck there. Just say, I'm, you know, this is what we're good at. We're good at changing the function of your body. You do your part. We're going to do our part. And I think, you know, in, you know, we're going to, we're going to have a good outcome. Right. Well, I think too, like, when you're trying to, to work through these plans, I was just thinking about a couple of patients I had yesterday, some new patients. We have a holiday weekend coming next week, so it's hard to like, you know, I'm only going to get to see them probably twice in the matter of two weeks when in reality I need to see them more. So then setting that expectation up of like, okay, well, there's a holiday weekend this weekend. So, you know, we got to set some groundwork here. And then after the holiday, we got to kind of reevaluate. and pre So giving yourself a little bit of a, an opportunity to then reevaluate, even if it's sooner than those three weeks or, you know, maybe it is four or five weeks, but being upfront and honest with them, I think is, is a big one. And, you know, you talk about that with having the confidence and uh, to, to actually come through and say what that means. I know that's something that we worked on with myself really early on in those first couple of years of me and seeing patients is just say what, say what you're going to say, you know, say twice a week for three weeks. And then you can always change that, you know, within a week or two, you know, they're not going to hold you down to that twice. Well, it's my third week. So here we are, you know, I'm, I'm this much better, you know, like it's, having realistic, realistic expectations with function with them up front, I think gives you a uh, longer and better outcomes. Yeah. And I mean, I, and if I, in the people that will push back on you on any of this is one out of a hundred, let's yeah. say, but that one, I mean, I'll just quickly give them an analogy. Like you didn't show up at the gym, work out one time, and then everything is the way that you want it to be. You didn't get braces on your teeth and wake up the next day and, Oh, my, my teeth are perfect. Now I'm going to get my braces off. So to make change takes a little bit of time. And I think if it, if it's done like very organically and holistically, like patients, uh, they, they want it. I mean, yeah. this is what, I mean, our, this is what people are clamoring for, you know? And I think everybody who's listening to this has been in the position where you've cut a patient loose. And as they're walking away from you, they're like, that's it. I thought, you know, like, and then you realize that like people want their bodies to perform like Ferraris. Not everybody, but there's a subgroup that does. And you and I are in the treatment of treating Ferraris. We can also treat Ford Escorts. And I think that's like where, you know, clinicians, it's, it's, it takes a while to develop this, but you got to have a little bit of tact to kind of realistically know what does this patient actually want from me? I went through 10 years of my career where I was trying to turn everybody into a Ferrari and it was just exhausting, you know, and, and you can't make some, you can't want more out of someone's body than what they're wanting for their own body. Right. So, but you're going to have a, there's going to be a group out there and we attract them. Like they want their bodies to perform well for their bodies to perform well. We got to see them. You know, I can't see you two times, give you a cat camel exercise and think that you're going to go out and perform like a Ferrari out there. Right. So I think no, Knowing when to use your skills is one of the most important physician skills as far as I'm walking into this case, this patient smokes two packs of cigarettes a day, they're not very healthy, they're, you know, they have a bunch of bad habits, like, of course, we're going to make an attempt to change that, but they're probably not your Ferrari. So you don't have to treat them like a Ferrari, you know, uh, make an effort. But I mean, like, if they're not going to, you know, do it, but I mean, there's so many of our patients out there, if they understood what the, our listeners are able to do to their body, they would be at your office every day. Right. Like, cause it's just, 
it, they have no idea. You can just tell by the things that they say. Like sometimes like, well, I went to a physical therapist and they said this, or I went to the surgeon, they said this, almost acting like you don't know that. You're like, do you really think I don't know what you just said? Right. So, but the, it just tells you what the disconnect is between the patient and, um, and us really. And, uh, so, I mean, I think that, you know, we, we, we have the best job in the world. And if, if the patients ever know what we're actually doing for them, they're going to actually be pretty excited. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, one question, Brett, that, uh, has come up a little bit like in seminars, I overhear people asking you, or they even ask me about yourself and things like that. Uh, we don't really do like a traditional review of findings, you know, like, so how do you kind of build that into that first treatment? Cause we are a very like treatment first, like yeah. you, know, you come here expecting to get treated. We want to treat you that first day. How do you build in that report of findings and kind of like, uh, breaking down the case for them in that first, you know, 15, 30 minutes that you have with them, uh, on a day one. Yeah. And I think this probably goes against what, like the traditional old chiropractic management would tell you to do because you're having to like establish buy-in. I just know myself, I'm such a skeptic myself. So for the second I feel like I'm getting sold something myself personally, I start to push back. So like our report of findings here looks a little bit differently where, I mean, we definitely do a full examination, but like we definitely go to the thing that we need to educate them on. And that's that. I mean, if they're obviously a discogenic case today, they don't even know that I know anything about DNS or that you know anything about DNS. Like they're in the McKinsey hospital today. So I, one thing I also learned when I was young was like, I get better compliance. Like if I just am real simple with, with what I'm educating them on. So, you know, if, if they're an acute disc herniation today, all we're talking about is, you know, this is why I need you to do press ups. This is, you know, we want you to correct your posture for a couple of weeks. Um, and then in two weeks, then that case actually makes a transition into more of like a, a DNS rehabilitation or not necessarily DNS, but more of like a rehab uh, type profile. And I think then patients can actually grab onto it. If you just sit there and educate them for 10 minutes about a bunch of stuff, they leave not knowing really anything. So I think to answer your question directly would be, um, we also, uh, as it turns out, I don't know if people realize this or not, but the more people you see, the more money you make. So if you're doing a bunch of redundant tests that aren't changing what you're going to do, that's considered to be a waste of time. Right. Mm -hmm. And I always tell a story of, uh, Vladimir Yanda when he was in Buffalo, this is before my time, but the story was told to me by one of my mentors and they said, uh, so Yanda was talking and they said, one of the people in the, the crowd said, well, when you did your six functional test, you know, what did you find? And he just stopped the person and shut it down and said, I haven't done my own functional test in 20 years. Mm -hmm. And it like, basically the room just got all quiet. And, and what he meant by that was he had earned the right to take a shortcut. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what a lot of the season, uh, physicians or chiros or PTs are going to, uh, realize is, you know, at some point you're going to feel like you're taking a bunch of shortcuts. You're going to basically think you're, you become a little bit lazy mm -hmm. when actually what's happening. A lot of times you could be becoming a turd, but sure. what happens a lot of times is you've just done it so much that you're able to take shortcuts that younger clinicians can't take. And the benefit to that is you get to see more people. So you, um, you know, I always look at it like, what is the least amount of time that I can spend with a patient and hopefully still get like a world-class result. Yeah. And, uh, and, and for us that ended up being a 15 minute mm -hmm. time slot, basically. Like I, I've definitely played around with, and we definitely cheated here with double bookings and yeah, stuff. Sure. But I mean, at the end of the day, when I, when, when I, if you go from 30 minutes to 15 minutes, your results will be the same. If you go less than 15 minutes, stuff starts to kind of fall apart. fall apart a little bit. Yeah. Perfect. That's good. And I mean, I think functionally too, like what I really, and it's a DNS theme, but I've stolen it for the joints and also with the soft tissues, which is basically what our goal is. We've all you know, palpated, felt, or observed a normal developing nine or 10 month old baby, right? So what do those joints feel like? What do those soft tissues feel like? That's a time in all of our lives, if everything's going the way that we want, that everything is neurologically so pure and perfect. So what I'm actually imagining in my mind, and this is the mind F I do every day, every patient of my day, is I'm imagining what I'm feeling and I'm comparing it to or seeing to the normal developing baby. And that tells you what ideal is. Even if I see an 80-year-old stenotic today, 
I'm not going to return them back to, but in my mind, that's yeah. kind of what I'm going for. And like, I think sometimes too, when you're young, you don't know what tissue densification feels like. You don't know what a trigger point feels like. You don't know what true joint block feels like. Sometimes it's really helpful to feel what normal is first. And the baby gives you like, you spring that baby's spine, you're going to be like, okay, this is what perfect joint play feels like. Or if you feel the soft tissues in their anterior latissimus dorsi, you'd be like, okay, that's what normal should feel. Now you're working with an MLB player. What does that feel the same? Mm -hmm. And then you get, you get almost like a goal to be shooting for. This is what I'm trying to, you know, return my patient to. And again, you'll have, you'll have a lot of miracles in your attempt to try to get them to that point, And they'll probably die before you get them to that. <laughs> right. right. Sorry to interrupt your episode guys. I have to tell you about an important date to write down in your calendar, November 3rd through the 5th, the first annual Neurodynamics World Congress coming to you at Parker University in Dallas, Texas, November 3rd through the 5th. This is an amazing opportunity to see a true gestalt weekend, meaning integration of multiple different people, multiple different techniques of the likes of Michael Leahy, Antonio Stecco, Brett Winchester talking about DNS, Annie O'Connor talking about pain classification mechanisms, David Seeming talking about the internal chemistry, uh, Jeff Bove talking about the research around nerves, uh, and of course, Michael Shacklock talking about neurodynamics. This weekend at Parker University, November 3rd through the 5th, is, 5th is your opportunity to see not only lectures, but hands-on demonstrations and panel discussions at the end of every day to combine this all together to show how each of these different techniques is influencing the nervous system. This is an amazing opportunity to see all these people in one stage and one opportunity to have some fun with us uh, in Gasol education. So uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode and we can't wait to see you at Park University. It's November 3rd through the 5th. Registration open at gestaltedu.com backslash courses. See you there. Right, <laughs> that's exactly right. Well, Nate, maybe let's switch gears here, Brett. Um, let's let's talk maybe uh, some examples of some cases that do need that management and, and kind of have to educate. I, I had one yesterday that I, I, I was thinking about when we kind of came up with this topic. Uh, I saw a freshman soccer player with some lateral hip pain yesterday. So uh, through the exam, like a little bit of more retroversion in her right foot or her right hip. She's right-footed. She, that's where her right uh, hip pain is. So she's got some retroversion there. She's got some pinching with uh, like a fibber or uh, like flexion internal rotation. So uh, my education was kind of based around that. Like I, I felt like the lateral hip pain was maybe like a, a symptom of this more kind of a bigger topic of the muscles not acting right because of the retroversion, because of the impingement. And so I just flat out kind of pointed that out. This is impingement. This is kind of how we manage it. Uh, you know, this is kind of what the road looks like as far as like for her to stay healthy and if she wants to play in college and stuff we need to make sure that the muscles are doing the right synergy we talked about the abdominal walls playing that and so i felt like that was a kind of a good example of management because i'm never going to change that bony anatomy you know like she's got retroversion in her hip i'm never going to change how much internal rotation i can get in her hip because it's a bony block it's a yeah. bony infill so uh, that that's kind of what was my my example that i was kind of thinking about last night uh, and then this morning and, uh, you know, the plan for her is just to put in like an amazing program for her that, that she does for the next six, seven, eight years, hopefully of her soccer career. Love it. And then hopefully she doesn't have to have, uh, the, the surgery, uh, that we've talked about with Thomas bird and, and, uh, Dave King and like all those, guys. we have those options, but hopefully we never have to get there, but maybe what's, what's some of your continuums that like your favorite case examples that need management versus, uh, you know, fixing them. We'll put it that way. Yeah. I mean, the old saying, you got to row with yours you're born with. So like in that case, I mean, we have bad anatomy that we got to, you know, we just, all we can do is make a bad situation better by changing, you know, changing the function of everything around that area. So I think, you know, let's just roll with that example. Cause we've all seen this example a million times. So, um, you know, let's say that, you know, we do an, we do an arthrogram where they have a, uh, firm last tabular impingement with a labral tear, let's say, and they're new to you today. So, I would recommend not getting too lost in the whole labral tear situation. Instead, through your assessment, get your audits. So where is the trigger point presentation? Where is the tension and tightness in the soft tissues? Um, where is there joint blockage? Is that a factor? How's the intravalinal pressure? And then start there. And then don't get caught up in reevaluating that case every time you see them. So give yourself enough time to have success in that case. So let's say in three weeks, then we go back, we check the femoral adduction, internal rotation, and flexion. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that's a, in that example, that'd be a great thing to, to recheck or like a standing internal rotation test. And that's going to give you a window into whether or not changing the function of that case actually improve that case. Cause you're going to run into a case where you are going to give an amazing treatment to them and you're going to reintegrate all the trigger points. The soft tissues are normalizing the joints are joint playing better. The functional tests are better. And they're going to tell you they're exactly the same. And you should not beat yourself up over that. You did your job. You changed the function of the area around there. And sometimes it's just hot lights and cold steel, as we say. So then, you know, that's why we have great. We, that's why we have the Thomas Birds, the Dave Kings, the George Palettas, the James Andrews, you know. So thank God, because if without these great surgeons in, in the sports world, we'd be, you know, these athletes would be done. But what our job is, there are a ton of unnecessary surgeries, procedures, injections that are occurring because people are not doing a good job on the front end to vet that case out to see if they need those procedures. So you can almost think of yourself, especially in a sports world, is your job is to vet them out to see if they need the next orthopedic procedure. And oh, by the way, what you're going to find, it's going to, when you do a good job of this, I think it's just going to blow your mind on a daily basis, like how many things will get better if you give yourself enough time to be successful. Because if you take your next difficult case that you're struggling with and you ask yourself a real simple question, is this case going to surgery? If you're honest with yourself, you're probably like, there's no way this is going to surgery. So then don't let that case fall off in the black hole. Manage that case, take that on. And, uh, and I think that's where... Uh, you know, having people's next steps. We haven't talked about that. I think that's like a yeah. really important point, like in, in a report of findings, like mm -hmm. we all say this around here where we tell the patient, if I can't help you, we have the back line to an epidural steroid injection, to the best surgeons, to all the next things. To that the you imaging, the lab imaging. work. Yeah. And we know this, but like the average lay person doesn't even know that a chiropractor, the thing that I, I always tell the people around here is, Sometimes your patient actually thinks their primary care doctor is going to have better connections in that world than you would, which is insanity. But so like, you know, letting them know that way they're, they know that even if it doesn't go great, then, and I think too, is what I, what I tell the interns here is you're not going to learn from like the successes around here. Mm -hmm. You're what you're going to learn the most is, is when a case is not going the way that we want, what is said, what is done. Um, a big theme in my lectures now is like calling an audible mm -hmm. where by definition, an audible is you come up to the line to scrimmage, you look at the, the, you know, the defensive scheme or the formation and you see something that makes you need to change. Great quarterbacks are able to do that. Great clinicians are able to do that. They're able to like gather all the information and say, I need to, I need to make a change here. And these are what, like, if you're, if you're a shadow for the day, you just miss all of this. Like what? The, the really important decisions that are just happening, yeah. you know, moment to moment, moment to second. moment. And like, yeah, when you're young, you don't realize it. And then when you watch, when you watch someone who's really good at it, then you, you really learn to appreciate someone who's able to manage cases really well. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And I, I think it's so hard to portray that, you know, like, uh, we talk about integration a lot and like we've touched on a lot of the, kind of the intangibles that it takes for integration, especially in, in this conversation today, but it's so hard to convey those little things during your day that like you maybe just switch up an adjustment, just like a little bit, just change a little bit, or maybe you feel a little bit different in your palpation. So mm -hmm. then it choose, you know, you choose a different position or, uh, you're changing, all right, we need to maybe load this a little bit differently or things like that. And that, that's like the the hard thing I think you and I struggle with is like trying to tell the masses about those little adjustments that we mm -hmm. make. And sometimes you just don't know until you do it yourself. You know, you, until you actually feel the, the kind of the pressure of the failures and success, that's when you really feel it. And but I think like you have to pay attention sure. during your day. Like you, if you're not 100% present in those moments, then all these learning opportunities just get right. missed, you right. know. And I think that's where, and again, if you can just if you can keep yourself focused in the present moment, the, you should be exponentially better at the end of the day, almost to where like for me, and I know there's people out there that are like, I'm gaining injury, uh, not injury, gaining energy as the day is going on. I'm gaining injuries. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, mental injuries, because I'm like, 
you know, it, it, to me, I'm thinking so hard, you know, and like at the end of the day, I mean, we all here yeah, fall right in up. that beanbag and like just <laughs> drink On tequila. Floor, or, yeah. You yeah. Know, like yeah. it's, uh, it, just because it, I think it's taxing I it mean, is. to yeah. like really think, think your way through these cases. And I know that's not for everybody, but I mean, I think like if you're really wanting to master the art of like patient management, I think it's, yeah. That's and it's worth it because, like you said, like the successes will come. You know, it's something I struggled with a lot. And it's just like giving yourself time to be the hero. You know, like mm-hmm. if you kick these patients out that need management before, then somebody else is going to be the hero. Somebody else will just, or they'll just get better on their oh, own, you know? Good point. Yeah. And uh, if you're not there to, to be there, and it's not all about being the hero and having no, success no. and stuff like that, but also like it's, it's your reputation. It's, you know, you were doing the right things. You just didn't give yourself enough time to be there to see the success. And if you're playing the game within the game, even like if a case doesn't go exactly, exactly the way you want, you actually just had a huge learning opportunity. I mean, I look at every, like literally every single patient I see in that 15 minute encounter, I'm, I'm in the back of my mind. I'm like, besides helping this person, how am I getting myself better right now? Like what, what can I, you know, maybe I adjust a certain joint and I notice like the relationship far away from where I adjusted them. Or, you know, you dry needle a trigger point, you notice how it changes a trigger point far away from the body. You do a DNS corrective and you notice the the global change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what keeps you interested. And if you stay interested, you don't burn out. So, you know, me being, I'm, we're at our 20 year, uh, this is our, our clinics, basically 20 year anniversary right now. There's been days you're just the the public will grind you down, but I think the the one way to keep yourself going is that little game within the game, and that even if you're dealing with difficult people, that you're you're such a huge gift to humanity because, like, if you're in that chronic pain category, they can still receive manual therapy. Like, if to me it's a win, they may come in and say my pain's exactly the same but I'm not taking opioids anymore. I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I'm not, you know, like what you fill in the blank, but like, so in these cases, these chronic pain cases that we think we're not helping without you, these people, you know, and I mean, suicide's a big problem in chronic pain. So, I mean, like, I think like, you know, we don't have to like make excuses for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think like, if you look in our profession, you obviously have our dumb asses that are like grossly overutilizing, but then you also have like over here, that's grossly underutilizing, you know? And, uh, there, there is definitely, I mean, everything in moderation, as they say, I mean, there's, there's a point in that middle where you're able to uh, help, uh, help a lot of different people. But if you, if you, sometimes if you don't see them, you can't help them, you know? And, uh, and Corey Campbell always talks about the limbic adjustment, you know, which is, um, sometimes like what, how we're helping people has nothing to do with our treatment. It's more of like what we're saying to them or yeah. So yeah, exactly. Well, good. Uh, great, great, uh, great conversation today, Brad. I think it's, uh, you know, I know it's something you don't love the word fix. I don't really love the word fix either just because I, I think it has a weird connotation, but I think if you, if you change function, just keep rolling with that. Tell your patients about function, tell them how their patient, how their body should be working or, you know, why maybe they got to this point or, you know, do a little bit of fun education. You don't have to be so strict and, you know, uh, uptight with all your education, but talk to them a little bit about it. You know, talk to them about how their hips are shaped, talk to them about how that could influence other things in their body. And I think that they're going to be really bought into the things that you're doing. I think too, just being bought in on function. Like mm-hmm. if you could just take like the next day of your, uh, of your practicing life to go into work and like, just say, okay, I am today going to just focus on the function of this case. And I'm going to completely unplug myself from the subjective, subjective pain experience. And you're going to have a liberating moment that is going to be, it's going to be very addictive to you because you're going to be like, wow, that actually takes a lot of the pressure off because one of, one of my problems when I was young, Um, I, at the end of the day, all my patients were hopefully feeling better. I was feeling worse because I was taking on Mm. all of this difficult baggage for them. And finally, I'm like, you know, all I can do is just do this well, hopefully. And then, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where the, where the cards fall. But I, I think that is, especially a young clinician who's trying to impress everybody, it, you're taking a lot on. So don't take more on than you can handle. Just do what you can do today, change the function of the case. And I think that's, you're going to love your results because if function, if function, if function's getting better, pain is going to move in a parallel axis. And if it's not, then either you have a chronic pain patient, like you talked about before, mm-hmm. either, you know, we have multiple autoimmune diseases. Maybe we have 
former abuse, whatever it might be. They're in the chronic pain category, but you can also be in the chronic pain category by having shitty treatment, which is a lot of our patients, Mm -hmm. Uh, not our patients, but patients that end up in our, hopefully not our patients, (laughs) end up in all of our offices. Um, You know, so I mean, like, you know, we, these people with chronic pain, a lot of times, like, it's not that they're crazy. It's like, they just have not had the right direction in in their case. So that's right. Awesome. Uh, Brett, you got a little bit of travel coming up. You just were in LA for uh, the uh, California State Association. Yeah. Um, you were, where were you before that? Mizzou. Mizzou. And, and that's right. Parker, Orlando. Parker, yeah. Orlando. So um, we got some great seminars coming up at the end of the year. Summer's usually a little bit quiet for, for Gestalt Education on purpose, uh, but then the fall kind of ramps up. So obviously uh, you've already listened to one ad at the in the middle of this about the Neurodynamics Summit coming up in November. Uh, we'd love to see you there. It's going to be awesome at Parker. Uh, the TMJ course in... Uh, September, That's September, September, yep. mm-hmm. uh, dates do not do well with my brain. So, uh, September, uh, it's my favorite, one of my favorite weekends of the year. It's, it's so much fun. It's just an amazing course. Uh, if you deal with headaches, if you deal with a jaw, anything, uh, this is the course for you. I mean, you have to be there, you have to take it. And, um, we got DNSC, yeah. uh, DNS exercise one in New Jersey and Alabama. Um, I'm in Dallas in July. You're when you're in New Jersey, Got a Justathon. A Justathon. Uh, uh, MPI, Gates, MPI Gate. Gate. Yep. Uh, with you, yourself, uh, Mark King, and Thomas Show. And uh, so, anyway, we, we got a lot of awesome stuff coming up, guys. Uh, it's going to be a busy rest of the year. Hope you are having a good year so far. And uh, hope this conversation found you at the right time. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Good luck with patience. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.